Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. This is what you will hear on today's program. Brian Lynn reports on the spread of bird flu. Andrew Smith explains describing space events on everyday grammar. Then, Andrew joins Jill Robbins on Lesson of the Day. But first, Katie Weaver reports on a Nigerian town losing ground to the sea. The coastal Nigerian community of Ayatoro was founded in 1947. Often called a happy city, it was meant to be a Christian utopia or perfect place. But now its remaining people can do little against the rising sea. Sunken buildings are an increasingly common image along West Africa's at-risk coast on the Atlantic Ocean. Pieces of wood stick out from the waves. Broken structures line the shore. Waves break against old electrical poles. For years, low-lying nations have warned the world about the threat of rising seas. And Nigeria, Africa's most populous country, struggles to find an answer. Thompson Akinboye is a church leader in Ayatoro. He said prayers against the rising sea are on the lips of everybody at Sunday services. But they know the solution will require far more. Even the church has been moved away from the sea two times. The present location is now also threatened with the sea just 30 meters away, Akingboye said. Thousands of people have left. Among those who remain, Stephen Tunley's can only look at what is left of his clothing shop from a distance. Tunley said he lost $5,500 to the sea. Now, with water everywhere, he repairs canoes. I will stay in Ayatoro because this is my father's land, he said. In the past 30 years, Ayatoro has lost more than 10 square kilometers to the sea. Researchers studying satellite imagery of Nigeria's coast say several things are responsible for Ayatoro's disappearance. Olushegun Dada is a marine geologist at the Federal University of Technology in Akure, he said one of the reasons for the losses is underwater oil operations. As oil is removed, the ground can sink, he said. But he and his colleagues note other reasons, including the deforestation of mangroves that help protect the earth. Erosion from ocean waves is another problem. When we started coming to this community, then we used to have fresh water, Dada said. Today, the freshwater ecosystem is becoming a salty marine one. The change is costly in Nigeria. The World Bank, in a 2020 report, estimated the cost of coastal degradation in three nearby Nigerian states, Lagos, Delta and Cross River at $9.7 billion, or more than 2% of the country's gross domestic product. It looked at erosion, flooding, mangrove loss, and pollution, 
and noted the high rate of urbanization in the country. Nigeria only pays attention to coastal communities from time to time when the yearly flooding happens. But the people of Ayatoro cannot turn away. Ayatoro was like a paradise, a city where everyone lived joyfully, happily, said Arowolo Mofealua, a retired civil servant. She estimated that two-thirds of the area had been slowly swept under the waves. This is the third house we are living in, and there are some living in the fourth house now, and we do not have enough space for ourselves again. Four or five people living in a small room, you can just imagine how painful it is, Mofeolua said. If you look where the sea is now, that is the end of the former Ayatoro. For Oluwambe Ojagbohunmi, the community's traditional leader and head of the local church, the pain is not only in the loss of land. He says the community is losing in our socio-cultural and religious identity. Early this year, the Ondo state government said it would find lasting solutions to the threat to Ayetoro, a promise people say has been made before. It might be too late for efforts to be effective, Dada, the marine geologist, said. For years, he has hoped for an environmental study to be carried out to better understand what is causing the community's disappearance but nothing has been done. The Niger Delta Development Commission, a government body meant in part to deal with environmental and other issues caused by oil exploration, did not answer questions from the Associated Press about efforts to protect the community's coastline. The Commission's website lists a coastline protection project in Ayatoro. The project was awarded some 20 years ago, and the website describes it as ongoing. But local people say the project never started. I'm Katie Weaver. Researchers are seeking to learn why bird flu kills some animals quickly but causes only moderate illness in others. In recent years, bird flu is believed to have killed millions of wild and domestic birds worldwide. Other animals, such as seals, cats, dogs, and cows have also been infected. The virus is officially known as H5N1. It has largely stayed out of the human population. However, the World Health Organization, WHO, reported that as of April 1, 2024, H5N1 had caused nearly 900 human infections and 463 deaths since 2003. Most of the human cases involved direct contact between people and infected birds. In cases of the virus spreading between humans, Individuals involved were found to have had close and extended contact within households. The currently spreading version of bird flu was first identified in 1959, but the illness did not start to cause concern among health officials until a bird flu outbreak hit Hong Kong in 1997. 
that outbreak caused severe sickness and deaths in some humans. Scientists are still studying possible reasons the H5N1 virus has not heavily affected human populations. But some researchers fear the situation may change. Like other viruses, H5N1 has mutated over time. During the last few years, one particular bird flu version has been spreading quickly and widely. Dr. Tom Frieden is a former director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. He told the Associated Press about the ongoing outbreaks, there's a lot we don't understand. Frieden also heads the nonprofit group Resolve to Save Lives. He added, I think we have to get over the hope for the best and bury our head in the sand approach. Some researchers have theorized flu viruses that started in birds caused severe human pandemics. For example, pandemics that took place in 1918 and 1957 quickly spread among animals and people. Many experts think it would be unlikely the currently spreading virus will become a deadly worldwide pandemic. But to prepare for that possibility, U.S. health officials are developing vaccines that might be needed. At this time, they are not planning other measures. This is because the virus is not causing severe disease in humans, and there is no strong evidence it is spreading from person to person. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has said U.S. animal outbreaks have been reported at numerous dairy cow farms and among more than 1,000 groups of poultry. At least four human infections have been reported among hundreds of thousands of people working at U.S. poultry and dairy farms. Worldwide, doctors have so far identified 15 human infections caused by the current version. That count includes one death, a 38-year-old woman in southern China in 2022. But officials said most of the identified people had either no signs of disease or only mild ones. Some experts have wondered whether humans have built up some level of immunity after being infected by other virus forms or because of vaccination. But a study involving human blood samples suggested there was little to no existing immunity to this version of the bird flu virus. I'm Brian Lynn. Eye watchers have had a busy year so far in 2024. There has been much to see among the stars and planets. In April, many people in the United States were able to watch a total eclipse of the Sun. Coming up in the next few months, there will be a nova of two stars. This week, we will learn about some of the special words you can use to talk about objects and events in the sky. A nova is a star explosion. A pair of stars called T Corona Borealis, called the blaze star, will become very bright, so people almost everywhere on Earth even in cities, can see it. Scientists say the event will be 
visible to the naked eye, which means you do not need any special tools like binoculars or a telescope to see it. Visible is an adjective form related to the word view. The two stars that form the blaze star produce an outburst or increased period of energy around every 80 years. Rebecca Hounsell is an assistant research scientist specializing in NOVA events at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. We don't often see a repeated outburst in a human lifetime, and rarely one so relatively close to our own system, Hounsell said. Material from one star moves toward another and causes the explosion, or outburst, of energy. This makes the bright light we can see from Earth. Scientists say they are not sure exactly when we will be able to see the nova. But you will surely hear about it on the news. Your next question might be, how can I find it in the sky? This is when you will need to know the word constellation and how to find one in the sky. A constellation is a group of stars. Some constellations look like particular shapes to people on Earth. The nova coming this year is in the constellation Corona Borealis, or Northern Crown. There are many uses for the preposition between for talking about the upcoming nova and its constellation. If you make an imaginary line between the stars in it, you get a curved line that looks like a headpiece worn by kings and queens. To find it, you can look for the two brightest stars in the northern hemisphere, Arcturus and Vega. In the space between them, you will find two constellations, Hercules and Bootes. Northern Crown is between them. People enjoyed another event in the sky in April, a total eclipse of the sun. The moon moved between Earth and the sun, causing a shadow or an area of darkness on Earth. The path of the moon's shadow on Earth is called the path of totality. We can change an adjective, such as total, to a noun with the noun suffix ity. The resulting noun means the state or condition of what the adjective describes. For example, it is used with active to form activity. The next total eclipse on Earth will be August 12, 2026, and it will be visible in Spain. And that's Everyday Grammar. I'm Andrew Smith. And now, the lesson of the day. Hello, my name is Anna Mateo. My name is Andrew Smith. And I'm Jill Robbins. You're listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English Podcast. Today's lesson helps you do more with Level 2 of our video series, Let's Learn English. This series shows Ana Mateo in her work and life in Washington, D.C. Lesson 2 of Level 2 is called The Interview. Ana's friend Pete has an opportunity for a new job. Ana's boss, Ms. Weaver, is going to interview Pete for the job. The person who asks the questions is called the interviewer, and the person answering the questions is called the interviewee. Right. 
Just like a company or person who gives a job is the employer, and the worker who gets the job is the employee. Anna also gets a new job or role, and that's spelled R O L E, in lesson two. Your role at work means the special functions or activities you do. Anna still works for Ms. Weaver, but Ms. Weaver tells her, "Anna, you're good at asking questions, so I want you to go back to hosting and reporting." Go back is one of many phrasal verbs you can hear in the video. It means to return. Let's listen to the robot teacher, Professor Bot, talk about them. I wonder what Anna's new assignment will be. Professor Bot here. While you are watching, look for phrasal or two-word verbs. Some stay together, like go back, and some can come apart, like give out. Good luck, Anna. In the video, the word assignments appears between the words give and out. That means give out is a separable. Phrasal verb. In other words, we can separate the two words and put another word between them. So Ms. Weaver is telling everyone what their new assignment is. Here's another example. This time with the phrasal verb "turn on." We can say "please turn on the light," or we can say "turn the light on." Both mean to cause a light to shine. Now let's see what else Ms. Weaver has planned for Anna, and be sure to listen for phrasal verbs as well. So, as I said at the meeting last week, I have new assignments for everyone at the studio. Anna, you're good at asking questions, so I want you to go back to hosting and reporting. That sounds great. You're also a team player, so I want you to team up with someone. That sounds even better. Someone who is very different from you. That sounds. What do you mean, different? Well, you are very cheerful. You're a people person. I want you to team up with someone who isn't. Ms. Weaver. I will find that person. What kind of person do you think Anna will try to find? Ms. Weaver said Anna is very cheerful and a people person. A people person is an expression that means a person likes to be with other people. Cheerful means happy and sharing good feelings with others. So if Anna teams up with someone different, that person. Probably doesn't usually want to be around a lot of people. Team up with is another phrasal verb. Doctor Jill and I team up with each other to do the lesson of the day on the Learning English podcast. So team up with just means to work with another person or group of people. Now let's listen and see who Anna finds. Pete, hi. Thanks for meeting me. Sure, but. I don't have lots of time, Anna. I'm busy, looking for work. Pete, you can tear these one ads up and throw them away. I have good news. Anna, I was working on that crossword puzzle. Oh, sorry, sorry. Pete, forget about the crossword puzzle. I have a job offer for you. I'm listening. My boss wants me to team up with someone to host a talk show. But the person must be different from me, so I thought of you. Different from you? What do you mean? I'm sorry, Pete. I don't have time right now. Here's my boss's address. Your interview is tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. But what do you mean different? Just be yourself, Pete. Just be yourself. Anna takes Pete's newspaper and tears it up, or rips it. Into two pieces. Tear up is a phrasal verb, and Professor Bot tells us about another one. 
Did you find any two-word verbs? Here's one example. Pete can throw the want ads away. Throw away is a two-word verb. Thanks, Professor Bott. But since our listeners are not watching the video, we should explain that throw away means to place something in a waste container. Now, let's see how Pete does in his interview with Ms. Weaver. Thanks for coming in, Pete. Thanks for the opportunity, Ms. Weaver. I need to find out if you have the skills for this job, and I want you to be completely honest. Okay. First, let's talk about your personal skills. Pete, are you a people person? Well, okay. Sometimes I think people talk too much. Pete, what work of yours are you most proud of? Last year, I locked myself in a cabin and wrote a book. I didn't speak to anybody the entire time. It was the best two months of my life. Okay. I think I've heard enough. It sounds like Pete is not a people person. Do you think Ms. Weaver will team him up with Anna? Probably. By the way, Ms. Weaver used another phrasal verb there, find out. She wants to learn or gather information about Pete's abilities. That's because she wanted Anna to team up with someone different from herself. Grumpy is an adjective to describe a person's mood or personality. It describes someone who is a bit unhappy or does not share positive feelings with others. I remember some years ago on YouTube there was a grumpy cat that became very popular. The cat's face made it look grumpy. Yes. All you need to do is enter the word grumpy in YouTube or Google, and you will find many pictures and videos of that cat. So we find that Pete got hired for an unusual reason, because he was grumpy and not a people person. So that makes him different from Anna. Well, they say that good teams need to have different kinds of people on them. Hmm, what does that say about us, Andrew? I think we have different ways of teaching, but together they work pretty well. In future episodes of Let's Learn English Level 2, we'll see the kinds of assignments Anna and Pete take on. And that brings us back to the phrasal verb from the beginning of the video. Listen. Hey! Hey! Pete! How was the interview with Ms. Weaver? Well, she said I was grumpy and not good with people. And? And I got the job! I knew it! Congratulations! Ah. Let's go celebrate! Okay. To take on something is to accept a duty, job, or responsibility. We say we take on a new job, we take on work, we take on a new role, take on responsibilities, and so on. And this phrasal verb is separable. For example, if we use the pronoun it, we can say take it on. But if we use a longer noun like assignment, we place that noun after the phrasal verb. So we say take on the assignment. We hope you will watch all the lessons in Let's Learn English to see what roles Anna takes on. And have you taken on a new role at work or in life recently? Perhaps you have a new job, or perhaps you have recently become a parent. Write to us and let us know. You can send us your email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And remember... You can also find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for listening. I'm Andrew Smith. And I'm Jill Robbins. And that's our program for today. 
Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm